Welcome to Advanced TV Herstory. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. This is the place where we connect the dots of TV and feminism to American culture and politics. If you like what you hear, head to tvherstory.com and listen into all of our archives that are categorized to make it easier to find what you're looking for. And also, while you're there, please sign up for our newsletter. Promise I'll never sell your information. Now, on with the show. Hey there, TV historians. We're logging another lesson of what I think of as TV talk show style and panache. This time, it's demonstrated by one of the finest actors of all time, one of my personal favorites, Vivian Lee. Depending upon your age, you may have no idea who Vivian Lee was. And you know what? That's fair. She passed away in July of 1967 at a dramatically young age, 53, of tuberculosis and pneumonia. But we're bringing you this episode in March 2024 because it's Oscar season. And our focus is on the renowned telejournalist, before Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow's TV talk show called Small World. And it's super cool for a number of reasons. Number one, it was incredibly high tech for its time. And I'll explain why in a, in a second. Second, it covers some incredibly progressive topics, not just for its time, 1958, but even as topics that we talk about and continue to talk about today. And so you'll hear more about that. And also one of the very few bits of video available of Vivian Lee just being herself. So I think you'll have some fun with that. About Vivian Lee, in her relatively short film career, she earned two Academy Awards, two Oscars, one for Gone with the Wind, 1939, which you may know of, and then secondly, in 1952, for A Streetcar Named Desire. So we have Edward R. Murrow, who is, in a sense, the talk show host of Small World. And these episodes, some of them, are available on YouTube. And they are literally time capsules of notable world figures. Murrow sort of lightly manages the conversation with his guests, who participate in a lively fashion, wherever they happen to be. It's like literally a 1958 Zoom call. And so we see Vivian in her very stylish London flat. And we see famed studio head Samuel Goldwyn in his office. And then there's British film critic Ken Tynan in what appears to be maybe his office. And Edward Armorow himself is seated at this big desk with a big sort of radio style microphone and an impressive array of books behind him. It's just stunning. And it's all in black and white. And seemingly, they set it up as a four-way telephone call, which in 1958 could not have been easy or cheap. And then they had film crews in all four locations. Logistically, it was impeccable. I, I just, it's, it's so noteworthy. And, and they are so well-preserved. Edward R. Murrow, pre-Walter Cronkite, he rose to fame as a radio reporter and broadcaster during World War II. He then successfully transitioned to TV in those early days of TV. And so he really kind of created one of the, the prototypes of the white male anchor. We see him, Vivian Lee and Ken Tynan, all smoking during the episode. Like you see whiffs of puffs of smoke flying around in their video. And like, it's such that you can almost smell the smoke. I digress. All right. So a little bit more about who we know who's in this show. So Edward R. Murrow, yes. Vivian Lee, yes. But at the age of 20, film mogul Samuel Goldwyn, and I have to say, I haven't seen too much video ever in my life of him speaking as himself. Well, he had emigrated to the U.S. from Poland right around the turn of the century. And he was penniless and he was ambitious, like so many who built the film industry. And so as kind of a classic sales guy, he joined the film, the industry, actually when it was still vaudeville. And as it was evolving into film, first in New York and then in Hollywood. And as you may have recognized, he is the middle name of the empire that was known as Metro Goldwyn Mayer, still known as MGM. And so here in 1958, Samuel Goldwyn is in his late 70s. And you'll clearly hear his Polish accent that he is not entirely lost. But more importantly, you will hear a white man struggling to retain sort of the, the norms and the grandeur of his lifetime's efforts and accomplishments. Uh, this was the industry that he helped build and the rules by which he built it and wants to, I think, continue to enforce. But there's no question change is in the air. Then we have British sort of prickly known. His reputation was being a prickly British critic, Ken Tynan. 
And he sort of represented that change, however. Steinem's incredibly busy career challenged the established ways of acceptability in all sorts of art forms. He died in his 50s as well, of emphysema no less. But as a critic, he praised talent. He called out artists who were coasting on their laurels, who weren't evolving with the times. And he attempted to shine a spotlight on how art ultimately brings about social change or is just as actors and artists sitting on its laurels. And and that made him very controversial for the time. So I can only say this, what a lineup. This is Sam Goldwyn in Hollywood. This is Vivian Lee in London. This is uh, Ken Tynan in New York. This is Small World and this is Ed Morrow in New York. Good evening. Tonight on Small World, the world of motion pictures. It would be interesting to know how long the actual conversation, the recorded conversations took, because Small World, once seen by the viewers of America, was a 30 minute long episode. And it came out down to about 27 minutes once somebody took the commercials out. And the editors, gosh, they teed up one controversial topic after the next. The first happened to be revolving around one of Ken Tynan's reviews that he made. He criticized a Broadway production of Hammer, of Rodgers and Hammerstein in which there was a Japanese actor who was cast as a character of Chinese descent. It's that fine line of representation that we talk a lot about today. But for a 1958 Sam Goldwyn, he kind of chose a false equivalency and he equated that artistic license to Vivian Lee, who as a Brit was famously cast twice as an American who had a distinctly Southern accent and a distinctly Southern vulnerable style. Well, I think if you're going to present the, uh, the Chinese people authentically and as they ought to be presented on a stage, you've got to pay some kind of respect to their, their origins and their culture, their appearance, and, and get a, a kind of authenticity that uh, I felt didn't exist in that show because there are differences of uh, background and uh, temperament between Chinese and, uh, Ken, and Japanese, which are tremendously marked. Uh, Ken, you might as well say that uh, no English actor should play in a Chekhov play. Or an Ibsen play. If the entire cast is English or um, German, okay. But what does it matter if they're artists? So clearly there's a lack of understanding about ethnic representation, uh, specifically for roles that call out a character's race being distinctly different. Tynan makes a really good point. And, you know, there was about 14-year age difference between Vivian Lee and Ken Tynan in this conversation. And you can almost hear Lee's intense competitiveness and to some degree perhaps a certain amount of sorrow of having aged out of plum film roles and and this shows you can hear it i think truth is the keynote of all acting or of all artists and i don't really understand what ken's saying because i don't think you would call it a stylized film in any way it's not like an 18th century comedy for instance it was perfectly human story and as modern as they come really The fact that you wear a costume doesn't make any difference to your mind. And if your mind is truthfully playing the character you're supposed to be playing, the costumes and whether you have a fan in your hand or anything, it doesn't make any difference at all. But then the only interesting thing, I think, is to play as many different things as possible. I think typecasting and type acting is one of the menaces, really, because you get used to what somebody's going to do and then it holds no surprise for you. If you're not going to be surprised in life, um, it's a pity, I think. Listeners, I have to say, in rewatching this, and I've seen it now um, many times, my immediate thought goes out to Hattie McDaniel and Butterfly McQueen, two well-known women actors of color, because their entire careers were premised on a racial limitation to their acting opportunities. Yes, McDaniel was the first actress of color to win an an, an Oscar for the best supporting actress role in Gone with the Wind. And we all know how many decades it took for the next woman of color to win an Academy Award. Both Butterfly McQueen and Hattie McDaniel were accomplished actresses in their own right. They certainly could have done very well had the rules not been stacked against them. 
but rather their only real choices were the roles of either a domestic or a nanny. But I will say, so as much as Vivian is a bit blinded to that, and of the age to have never given that a whole lot of thought, perhaps, and competitive to want every single role for herself, she does earn a feminist merit badge, I'll say, for having to listen to Tynan's insufferable mansplaining, which includes referring to grown women as girls. Miss Lee mentioned typecasting, which of course is a product of the star system. And I suppose one reason that she has not been typed is the fact that she is a genuine actress as well as a star. Isn't the definition of a uh, star there, Vivian, uh, a girl who can stare into a camera and convince every man out there that she needs him and cannot <laughs> exist without him? Well, no, I don't think that applies entirely. It, she may uh, think she wants to um, uh, say that to everybody, men, women, and children. I don't think men are all that important. But I mean, isn't there a special kind of hungering, yearning, needing expression which Garbo had, which Marlena Dietrich has, and I also think you have it, this sort of look of unutterable need, and uh, everybody in the audience feels, my goodness, she needs me. I my goodness, me. Ken, I think that a certain waif-like, if you like, not, I don't mean waif-like, but I, I think people shouldn't appear too sure uh, of themselves because they probably aren't as a rule. Listeners, watching this, you literally need a scoreboard. It's kind of cool. Tynan and Lee volley opinions, well-grounded, capably spoken, respectfully generated opinions back and forth. Boom, boom, boom. They do not hold back. So in part two of this three-part series that's posted on YouTube, Tynan serves up yet another controversial thing, and that is he starts talking about the role of art as a political act. And he puts forth a, a bit of a hypothetical. Perhaps in 1958, it wasn't a hypothetical. I, I, I can't imagine what might have been going on. But he asserts that the notion of casting a Negro, in, that's his word, not mine, as a normal person. I'm kind of thinking, actually, guess who's coming to dinner comes to mind. And the, and the tremendous, wow. Uh, the tremendous history that was made in that film starring Sidney Poitier. Sam Goldwyn's entire career as a filmmaker was spent, not, not filmmaker, maker, but rather a studio guy, was spent keeping performers of color in a small box so as not to lose racist audiences. Uh, that's their, their uh, defense, not mine. So in this particular case, he chooses not to see storytelling as a political act, and Tynan kind of calls him out. But then Edward R. Murrow, perhaps in uh, post-production, redirects to Vivian Lee using language that steps away from the controversial word political and is just a little bit different. Uh, Miss Lee, do you think movies, or for that matter, the theater, ought to have a point of view? I do. Well, this I, has a point of view. I do. In fact, I agree with Ken that they, they have a point of view whether they really want to or not, because any good playwright cannot help being taken up with uh, the way the world is going. And I suppose politics come into that. I know nothing about politics. And I don't think I like them at all. But I think that um, the social conditions in every country are bound to come into any play of any interest. Whether it's brought in or not pure propaganda, I naturally don't like because I think it's always pretty dull. But I think it comes into any play or any movie, whether that movie sets out to put it in or not, because I think any dramatist of any stature naturally deals with the world as he sees it. So on YouTube, parts two and three are filled with more lively debate about stage and opera and directors and producers, and they mention names of very prominent, cool people in Broadway shows and films that were well known throughout the 40s and 50s. It's a, it's a really great walk back. I am grateful to the YouTube account, Taylor Mays, whoever you are, who posted these to YouTube because I'm left with the loss that Vivian Lee had a whole lot to say and had very few opportunities to express herself. We shouldn't let these moments go by. Lee never had the chance to write her memoirs. Uh, you know, she was in ill health for many of her years, her later years, and physical health as well as mental health. And while many 
books have been written about her, they, and they usually include her voice in the form of personal letters that were found in other people's collections or from her collections. Letters are not the same as this sort of speaking on her feet and speaking from her heart. Lee's career was not just cut short due to age, but she was also becoming tagged as difficult and unpredictable to work with. And in fact, she was experiencing symptoms of uncontrolled bipolar disorder. If you track this at all, you, re- you may know that lithium wasn't even tested for use for the controlling the effects of bipolar disorder until about 1974. And lo and behold, it was another 10 years before Patty Anna Duke explained the disorder and lithium's effects for her on TV to to Phil Donahue on his nationally syndicated talk show. I did an episode in 2016 about Patty Duke and her incredible childhood, her TV legacy. It's it's one of my favorite episodes. And then I actually did a follow-up with a gentleman named Bill Jankowski uh, about a book that he and Patty Anna Duke wrote just short of her death. Incredible, incredible life story. Bipolar disorder in the incredibly talented and how it was managed in the 50s and 60s and 70s is nothing short of, well, a true understanding of a medical miracle. But in 1958, TV executives thought this level of critical thinking was important for viewers across America. And they spent big money to bring these voices together. I find it and every YouTube time capsule I encounter simply fascinating. This is a look at America, or in some cases, this is a look at the world that was put to video and now is available to us whenever we want it. And this is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Check out Taylor Mays, T-A-Y-L-O-R-M-A-Y-E-S. Also, links are in the show notes. Check out Taylor Mays' channel on YouTube. There is more cool stuff and some more episodes of Edward R. Murrow's Small World. Are you interested in books on Vivian Lee and her incredible career? Do go find them. They are there. Some really great books have been written about her. Go for the newer ones because they happen to have a more medically accurate depiction of her uh, her complicated medical life. Thank you to Jazzer, whose music and our jingle are found at freemusicarchive.org. As always, a big thanks to the team that is behind this podcast. Mary Lou Moreau's skillfully uses a scalpel to bring this audio from the 66-year-old recording to your ears. Thank you, Mary Lou. And Nivia Lopez, who is helping me experiment with visual storytelling in such a way that it's compelling and has you staying on to the very end, which leads me with this. Most importantly, thank you for sticking with us as we try these new approaches to bringing TV history and connecting the dots of TV and feminism to American culture and politics to you. Thanks for recommending us to your friends. That's a huge sign of trust, and we're grateful for that. And lastly, please do send your thoughts, your thoughts, your ideas, whatever you got that's going up on in your head. Go to tvherstory.com and shoot us a message. That includes ways to connect with us, and you can sign up for the newsletter. It comes out monthly. Promise your information will never be sold, but it is a way for you to kind of get a feel for what we're up to without having to hunt us down on social media. Thanks for listening and watching. 